Diane's passionate about bringing together seemingly disparate ideas to yield deeper understanding, especially when it comes to how we learn and how we deliver learning at scale. As an EdTech veteran, she's been helping higher ed navigate through surges in technology, standards, and data analytics since the mid 2000s. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here um, and to be part of this conversation. I've enjoyed very much um, the keynote and, and Rob's um, address just now, and I think that uh, we're going to keep on moving this discussion forward. I think uh, there's some really great themes that are appearing uh, here. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen here, and forgive me if I'm, uh, hang on one second, I'm just getting my slide advancement down, right? Um, so I'm gonna talk about why alignment matters more than ever in uncharted waters, especially. And I'm gonna start with, of course, a little bit of storytelling. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, deep sea diving or even snorkeling, um, it's amazing how this one experience in something like a vast ocean, um, it, it can be, uh, it can really bring up some differing emotions and yield some different experiences depending on if you enjoy the water or if you fear the water. And right now we are in deep uncharted waters this year. Some of us feel like we're drowning, some of us have proper equipment to stay afloat, and some even have the seemingly miraculous means to breathe underwater. The thing is, when the currents are rough, when visibility is imp impossible, we can forget how to utilize even the best equipment available. Under the right circumstances, panic can set in for just about anybody. Certified divers know just how technical diving is and how much the diver relies on equipment to function and complete the dive. There's a required level of training. There's planning and testing out the equipment. There are communication protocols. There's a process. When you get out into open water for the first time or even for the hundredth time, the unexpected can happen. One thing that helps divers in various aptitudes is a dive line. This is um, a picture that I took uh, that happened to capture a dive line, even though it was probably a mistake photo. Um, but this dive line here is this structure um, that dive, divers can hold on to this structure when currents pick up. And it's a guide that that um, divers can also keep in their line of sight when they need to deviate and, um, and go and you know, complete a specific objective. It's a guide that everyone utilizes and that everyone understands its purpose and value to their own objectives. It's the guide that we can cling to when we are experiencing in an unprecedented way the discomfort of rapid change at scale. When a dive line or a shot line, sometimes people call it a shot line, is in place, divers can perform the objectives of the dive at various levels of complexity, even in low visibility, even in unexpected currents. It is the biggest difference between feeling like you're anchored and feeling like you're flailing. Curricular alignment can be the dive line that guides across functional teams and delivering the experiences where it's clear how to get students from A to B and why they need to perform C. So there is a, a, a body of evidence uh, about mapping and alignment to improve the quality of learning and student outcomes. This is not a new concept. Instructional design is a discipline that has been using mapping and alignment as a tool for quality in course design since at least the 1930s. So for almost 100 years. That does create over time this large body of evidence. We've seen a boom in 
that body of evidence with the emergence and um, maturation of online learning. And now where we have, um, you know, we're in this situation where everyone is adopting online learning at scale. This is really expediting that need to understand the body of research behind, um, behind uh, quality online design. So, but I loved what, uh, what Rob um, spoke about um, in his presentation about needing to actually design in a way that, um, that transcends the modality. The, the point is that we need to design in such a way that um, whether we're teaching online or face-to-face -face or in a blended environment, we have a solid plan of alignment between our learning objectives and our outcomes um, so that we can deliver uh, the, the learning at scale and those learning journeys for our students. So what happens when we apply this um, historical uh, practice of course alignment across programs, across collections of programs within a discipline, or across uh, an, an entire institution. So, um, and then when we start to incorporate all of our external requirements um, of alignment into the design as well. You might be thinking that you do this already, but uh, this is probably how it looks. Um, the current um, ways of documenting uh, alignment in our instructional design, whether it's a micro-credential or competency all the way up through you know, a four-year degree or professional degree, it is documented typically in a hundred different places or more. And there, there are as many ways of documenting and formatting these documents as well. And so we spend a lot of time on this planning, this strategic planning, and when it comes to execute, um, executing on those plans, it's often very difficult for teams to understand what the objectives are. So a visual modeling tool of your overall alignment helps to bring everything together in one location in a way that is simple to understand. It, this, when it's visual, when it's easily accessible by everybody, this can truly become that guideline that um, where folks can come to, uh, to feel anchored, to remember, you know, what are my objectives? How do I need to help guide my learners um, to reaching their goals? So everyone who's helping with the strategy and delivery of uh, learning at scale needs to have access to this guideline. And your longest threads of alignment are going to be your institutional outcomes. These are going to help you articulate consistently your mission, your vision, your values, your ethics, your community. It's going to really um, be such a compelling way to, um, to set yourselves apart um, within, uh, within your region as a place where, where folks will want to come virtually or in person or blended um, <laughs> and gather. So the, um, you can also, in your institutional goals, you will probably also have several quality frameworks that address accreditation needs and in, um, outside standards. They might be government standards. Um, they might be governing standards for different subject areas. But ultimately, these are all of your goals, your strategic goals um, as an institution. And believe it or not, there is Oh, there is a need to tie these very high strategic goals all the way down to, um, or all the way up to, <laughs> a, uh, um, your specific student learning objectives. And being able to articulate that alignment end to end, this thread that, that goes through your tapestry of curriculum, um, is really where we need to get so that we have um, so that we have some synergy between the learning experience and um, what you're promising your students they'll get from you. So the, um, 
There are also uh, external uh, outcomes that largely come in at the uh, school or college level, that division within your institution. And these really uh, encompass, you know, uh, subject area specific industry outcomes, program level outcomes, different licensures or exams that your learners need to be able to perform and, and pass, you know, at the end of their experience or throughout their experience with you. But overall, we're really talking about your skills and your high level goals. And then at the course level, we have our curriculum design goals, which are going to encompass your course level outcomes, your competencies, your student learning outcomes, learning objectives, modular objectives, enabling and terminal. And across all of this, you are going to have an assessment strategy. And you might be thinking, but we don't assess our mission and values. Um, no, but you do think about your mission and vision and values and ethics and community initiatives in terms of how do we define success? And that's, that in itself is an assessment strategy at the very highest level. Um, so that assessment strategy and vision also needs to uh, be able to be discussed um, across the institution from from you know from all levels so um when uh let's see also i just want to point out that these these in particular the institutional goals and the school or college goals they really set the stage for um, backwards design from a division level or a division or program level outcome all the way down through um, your learning objectives. So this type of alignment, it is a big, it's, it's a big deal, right? And it's a big job. And it does require collaboration um, across multiple teams. So this is where having a highly visual modeling tool uh, that is collaborative and that makes sense um, regardless of a person's background in um, academia or pedagogy um, around the uh, instructional design. It just becomes mission critical to have um, access to this kind of a thing, especially in uncertain times. And what happens is this allows you, these um, visual analytics allow you to see at a glance whether we have gaps in alignment. Are we assessing every single learning objective that we are teaching? Are we reinforcing that assessment with appropriate learning activities that help to um, take our students from A to B? And back to all of those alignment requirements at the university level, at the division level, um, across specific learning journeys. So this might be your program level, but these also might be collections. This might be your stack degrees. This might be your credentialing towards a badge um, pathways. And then your course level objectives. Your courses are going to each have their own course goals. So if you know that students are struggling with interpreting graphs, you can see when and how often are we actually teaching that concept of interpreting graphs. What happens is over time, over time, this um, deep relational database that houses all of your learning elements and the linkages and relationships between them, it grows into this indexing system that you can search across your whole curriculum at every level and every type of learning um, element. You can attach OERs um, to this. You can link out to content anywhere. And what that ultimately helps us do when we are in uncertain times is have a valuable conversation, a productive conversation about how we are structuring the learning from a competency or course goal level. What we're looking at right here are three different sections of the same math course. They're all college algebra, Math 141. Here's Dr. Anderson's unique version. Here's our online version. Here's our traditional face-to-face -face or even blended version. Regardless of which 
uh, version of this course, we need to be able to see that the same course objectives are happening. Everyone who takes Math 141 needs to learn how to solve equations. So we can see that here at a glance um, across the variations. Everyone needs to interpret graphs. Everyone needs to do function notation. So there's a level of consistency that we need to make sure that our designs have um, for our students so that we can deliver on that promise of anytime, anywhere learning. So that it's not tied to specific scheduling uh, programs like the LMS. That the, uh, the alignment design of the curriculum needs to live, you know, outside of, outside of the, um, outside of the things that impact our day to day so that we can quickly and easily um, shift to, to uh, accommodate those things. So if we hop into this online course, we can see that there are uh, different ways of looking at the body of curriculum. We can see what students are learning. Here are my course goals. These are all, we're calling them competencies but we need to be able to adjust that terminology as well to accommodate different teams and how different people um, think about and structure their design. So we can see the learning objectives um, as they're outlined by course goal or how they align to course goals. But then we can also start to answer when students are learning. And like I said before, this is not tied to a calendar, but we're actually talking about the sequencing of learning. What are those exact steps that really help us get students from A to B? And when these are mapped out in this way, it really becomes clear um, about how to, how to shift um, quickly. I think when, um, when the great pivot online um, really first started happening, we saw um, a lot of faculty and instructional designers express across social media that one of the biggest challenges was not knowing which learning objectives um, students had already encountered and which learning objectives are left. I think this is probably the greatest, um, you know, the greatest uh, example of needing to have a design that sits outside of um, a, a structure for the curriculum that sits outside of the day-to-day -day of the curriculum so that you can um, so that you can see what is the plan if we um, made the the pivot online in module nine i can see which learning objectives are left that i need to um, deliver in in a different way and so we've so we've looked at what students are learning we've looked at when students are learning it we checked out you know how do we see you know, uh, how often students are learning it throughout the duration of the course. But let's look at it across a specific uh, learning journey. I'm gonna actually move into another, uh, let's see, College of Medicine. And we're gonna go in here because I wanna talk about those higher levels of alignment. You will have um, different requirements from the team on how you want to uh, communicate to students um, how you are helping them meet their goals that they need for their profession um, or even just subject area, right? So we have our medical professional qualities. We'll need to show accredited, accrediting bodies that um, the curriculum aligns to these accreditation requirements. So we can uh, do that in a way that really helps to illuminate the actual gaps that we might have. And now I can have a conversation about whether this is intentional design or whether what we're seeing here as a team um, is actually a gap. Instead of uh, looking at the traditional uh, spreadsheet of things and saying, there's something wrong here, it's broken. And right now nobody has time for that. Nobody has time to uh, try to decipher, you know, what is going on in those spreadsheets. Um, so I want to uh, head back to some of, um, some of these themes 
that when the program design is clear, my understanding as an instructor of where students should be when they come into my class and where they should be when they leave it can, um, the, the better that I can understand what that pathway or that journey looks like and what the expectation and requirements are over here, um, the better I can show up to my, to my work and perform uh, in such a way that I can really uh, help, you know, improve those student outcomes and create some memorable learning experiences for them. I can focus on that part of the teaching um, and because I know that the, the plan and, and alignment is clear. Now, this is all very ideal. Um, we know in execution, this is rough. This is really deep, deep work. And what we're often talking about is, um, you know, changing, uh, creating um, environments where people can rethink and um, kind of change their, um, change their perceptions of how this goes. Um, so I want to just point out here that engaging in these types of alignment initiatives across an institution, it really is about culture creation. It's just as much about change management and supporting your faculty and staff through this as it is about putting in place a really good process to help them do that. Um, I wanted to uh, share that this OER that is, it's, it is actually on Pressbooks. Um, so that was great that Rob introduced um, the, the platform of Pressbooks platform. It is an awesome OER uh, platform. And I, um, I had the pleasure of, you know, being part of this very large collaborative project um, with Dr. Whitney Kilgore um, about documenting current case studies that talk about um, instructional design best practices and talk about the need to map and align at the course level and at the broader levels across, um, across an institution. And what I love about um, the interviews and the case studies that, we've, uh, that we were able to capture in this is that there are so many voices that talk about how difficult this work is, that it really is such a collaborative initiative. And that it's, um, but I think right now at this point in time, we all have extra motivation to collaborate, to let some things go and really focus on the task at hand um, and produce what is uh, most important for our students. Um, so, Ultimately, no matter where the learning happens, the requirements of the course and the requirements of the program and the requirements of the institution, they're going to be the same. So our ability to act in moments of crisis and uncertainty is so it's much less painful when our course redesign begins from a framework of quality alignment and not from scratch. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Okay, we have um, a few minutes for questions. We have a couple questions. One from Margaret uh, is, hi, Diane. Are you seeing this tool being used specifically to shift from campus teaching to remote facilitated teaching and learning in the current climate? Uh, yes, yes, we are actually. Um, we're, we're definitely seeing that, uh, that it's aiding in that because um, those because folks who need to shift um, for a, a different delivery, they're able to take that same framework of alignment, make a copy of it, and then quickly update it for a new modality. So they're not having to start from scratch. They have all the known requirements very clear, um, and they can make adjustments. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of like, not just time and resource savings, but like, emotional savings there too you know the anxiety level is, is lower um because you're starting from um from a near finished uh alignment 
Great. And, um, uh, and, and Margaret says, thank you so much, Dan. Really useful. Uh, Richard asks, what advice do you have for those struggling to bring colleagues along toward uh, alignment, uh, e.g. if they don't understand its importance, et cetera? That's such a great, great question. And I think it is really important to um, get back to um, the relationship in that collaboration between individuals. And sometimes, well, oftentimes when there's resistance, it's because there's not understanding. And so really breaking that down to um, individual conversations. And sometimes it requires um, a, you know, a, a, a master teacher or a subject matter expert who it has um, a, a valued voice within the broader faculty members um, for them to do the work and then share that work and share those benefits with the rest of the faculty members is the most compelling way to, to really help people um, get on board because that peer-to-peer -peer voice is really what faculty members will listen to the most. And isn't that true for all of us, right? It's um, hard to believe that someone outside of our um, expertise, expertise and profession, um, you know, uh, can, can bring that to me, that, that value. But if it's coming from a peer, it's so much better. So build your own internal uh, use cases of alignment and those um, success stories of alignment and then share those stories and successes internally often. I think it's a morale booster. It helps people to see and especially when in when they're talking about it, when they talk about the struggles that they worked through, um, that becomes incredibly relatable too and it becomes a huge source of professional development for our faculty members to collaborate in that way. 